Well, good morning and welcome once again to the Mission Viejo Church of Christ. We are so thankful that you decided to spend this kind of gray, rainy, beautiful uh, Southern California morning with us. And we all know what that means, right? It's just going to be hot and humid later on this afternoon. So we'll enjoy this overcast uh, and, and kind of rainy morning while we have it. But we are so glad that you chose to spend the day here with us. Uh, it, we are working on a series through the book of Jonah, and this was intended to be like a one-sermon lesson that has turned into about a four- or five-sermon lesson, uh, because there is so much good stuff in the book of Jonah. And just in case that you weren't with us the last couple of weeks, I'm going to give you the fast-forward, super-quick version of the book of Jonah. So we know the book of Jonah starts with Jonah receiving a call from God to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. And we know what Jonah does. Jonah goes 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. That's the first problem, <laughs> right? So God gave him a calling, gave him an, a mission, gave him a job to do, and Jonah says, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'm going to actually not only not do that, but I'm going to go in the opposite direction. We talked about the fact that we as Christians do that all the time. We know what we're supposed to be doing, but instead we go to great lengths to avoid the things that God is asking us to do. So we know what happens. Jonah gets on this ship. He's going 2,500 miles in the wrong direction. See, I told you this is going to be quick. He's going 2,500 miles in the wrong direction. God brings a storm. The sailors decide eventually, right, that they have no choice but to throw Jonah over the side of the boat in order to save the boat, the rest of the cargo, and themselves. So they throw Jonah over the side of the ship. God provides a whale, or a fish, excuse me, I keep saying whale. He provides a fish, he provides a fish, right, that comes and swallows Jonah up. And Jonah spends three days in the belly of this fish. Now again, I don't know about you guys, I think fish smell bad on the outside. I can only imagine what Jonah was smelling for three days on the inside of that fish. But anyway, the fish swallows up Jonah, and he uses this time, this three days, that God uses to kind of, just like we talked about a broken bone in a cast, to, to mold Jonah back into what he needs Jonah to be and what he wants Jonah to be. And for the first time, Jonah is actually right where God wanted him to be. Fast forward, Jonah spends three days in prayer in the belly of the fish. He goes to God, and he prays this prayer of thanksgiving, and he prays this prayer of he knows that God is going to see him through this. That's why last week's sermon was actually titled, Hopeful, Not Helpless, because it would have been easy for Jonah to feel helpless in the belly of the fish, but instead he was hopeful. <sighs> okay, deep breath. That brings us to today. See, I told you it was going to be a fast recap of the first few chapters. But today we're going to jump into chapter 3. And here's where we're going to see that Jonah gets a second chance at this. Now, I titled this sermon, The God of Second Chances. But as you and I both know, we get way more than two chances from God. And thank goodness for that. Amen? Right? Because I probably already used my two chances this morning and it's only 11 o'clock. But let's just be real. That title is, is supposed to be catchy and it's supposed to get your attention because God is giving Jonah, remember Jonah's the reluctant prophet, he's giving Jonah a second chance to fulfill this calling that he has placed on his life. So we're talking today about the God of second chances, but we know that thank goodness we get way more than just two chances. So let's jump right in. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week, which is Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. Open your Bibles up. It says, And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. So this is kind of where we left off last week, right? Remember, Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish. Three days in the belly of the fish praying this prayer of hopefulness and this prayer of providence and this prayer that he knows that God is going to see him through this. So after three, what I'm assuming were very long days and nights, the fish comes up and vomits Jonah onto the dry land. Now think about that for just a moment. You're enjoying a nice day on the beach, and you've got your Coca-Cola, and you've got your book, and you've got whatever it is that you like to do at the beach, and all of a sudden here comes a giant fish and a man comes flying out. This would have been quite the sight to remember now, I want to throw something out there to you that you may or may not already know, and that's that Jonah is about to be commanded again to go and preach to the Ninevites. The Ninevites prayed to a God that was half fish and half man named Dagon. And maybe you already knew that, or maybe you didn't, or maybe you'd forgotten about that. So the fact that Jonah is being vomited or spit out onto the beach 
would have had some significant meaning as we work through our story today. So, I ran across this last night, actually, and I thought this is just perfect for what we are talking about today. And that's it. We're going to see that Jonah is about to be called to Nineveh again. And when we think of the gospel and we think of preaching the gospel, we think of these four walls, right? We think of the fact that we need to bring the gospel each and every week for our Sunday morning services. But where is it that the gospel needs to be taught the most? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we shouldn't preach the gospel on Sunday mornings, but I'm saying let's make sure that we're not just preaching the gospel here in church on Sunday mornings, but we're taking the gospel where it needs to go. See, when Jesus did his ministry here on earth, he didn't just spend his time teaching the apostles. He didn't just spend his time teaching his followers. He went to where the people needed to hear him. And it wasn't always easy, and it wasn't always pleasant. And he got a lot of criticism for that, right? Because he ate with the tax collectors, and he ate with the sinners, and he ate with the prostitutes. And see, Jonah is about to be asked to go to Nineveh again. And we know how this went down for for Jonah the first time. So let's pick up in Jonah chapter 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. A second time. See, Jonah's going to be given a second chance. Now see, Jonah has a decision to make. Jonah has a decision to make. Is he going to jump on the boat again and go 2,500 miles in the wrong direction? Or this time has he learned his lesson and he's going to go do what God is asking him to do? It says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it, proclaim to it the message that I have given you. It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Now, I want to stop right there for just a second. This was a large city. Now, at one point, if you look back at the history of Nineveh and of this area, Assyria, right, where where Nineveh was located at, which is uh, uh, present-day Iran, Iraq. Now I'm confused. Um, I don't know. One of the two. Anyway, uh, I think it's Iran. But anyway, so, or excuse me, it's Iraq. So anyway... This was a huge metropolitan city. At one point, this was actually the largest city in its day. It's it's thought to be about 120,000 in population. 120,000 people in this city. And this is where Jonah is being told to go. He's being told to go to this huge metropolitan city, this very powerful city where they're worshiping this this being that that is half fish and half man. Now, if you were here with us a couple weeks ago when we were in Jonah chapter 1 and we talked about why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because Nineveh was a city of barbarians. They did unspeakable things to people. So Jonah didn't just not want to go there. Jonah feared for his life to go there. And it's important that we understand that. It wasn't just that Jonah was saying, you know what, don't really feel like doing that today. He was scared. See, he had heard the stories. He knew about these barbarians and the awful things that they did to people and that they tortured people and that they murdered people. And Jonah didn't want to go. So again, what does Jonah do? He gets on the ship. He gets thrown overboard. He gets swallowed by the fish. He comes out of this, right? And God says, okay, Jonah, let's see what you've learned. And he gives him the same direction Again, I want to jump into the New Testament real quick and look at Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28. Again, Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28, it says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, and bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Now, see, I love this because God gets this, right? Which is why he's sending Jonah there in the first place. But Jonah didn't quite get the message. See, Jonah didn't quite get the email that we're to love our enemies and that we're to love those that persecute us. This is a tough passage, right? This is a tough passage for each and every one of us because it's really easy to pray for the people that you like and the people that you love. Hopefully we pray for each other on a daily basis. Hopefully we pray for this church and the leaders of this church on a daily basis. And that's easy because we love each other, right? We may not always agree on everything. We may not even always see eye to eye on things. But at the end of the day, we're a family and we love each other. And it's really easy to pray for you guys. 
But see, that's not, what, that's not what we read in Luke. See, now we're supposed to pray for our enemies, and we're supposed to do good to the people that are mean to us, the whole turn the other cheek thing, right? And bless those that curse you, and pray for those that mistreat you. See, that's where it gets hard. It's easy to pray for those we love. It's a whole other story when we have to start thinking about things like praying for our enemies. Now, it's important, and there's a reason that I threw this verse in. The reason I threw this verse in is that we're going to see as we move into Jonah chapter 4 and towards the end of chapter 3 that this message gets lost on Jonah once again. Spoiler alert. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But Jonah chapter 3, again, picking up in verse 4, says, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Again, it's all about the context, right? This is a huge metropolitan city. This is a powerhouse city in its day. And here's Jonah, the reluctant prophet, walking through the heart of the city saying, Hey guys, you got 40 days. You got 40 days and the city is going to be destroyed. Now this would have been a difficult message for Jonah to give. Because Jonah would have feared for his life as he's giving this message. But see, he's already made that mistake once of not doing what God has sent him to do. So this time he's going to try to get it right, at least for now. And he's going to walk through the city letting them know, hey, you got 40 days. Now I find it interesting that this is the message that he was sent to give. They were actually being given warning of what was about to happen. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we always got warning of the things that were about to happen? Now, see, we live in California, and California has these crazy things called earthquakes. Now, I'm not from California. It's pretty obvious. Not from California, but you guys have these things called earthquakes. And earthquakes, you really don't get much warning when an earthquake is going to happen. Now, I hear some of you say things like earthquake weather. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. But I hear, I hear California people say that, so maybe one of you can fill me in after church today of what earthquake weather actually is. But I hear people say things like earthquake weather. But let's be honest, we really don't know when an earthquake is coming. Now, I grew up in the Midwest. We don't have earthquakes, for the most part. But we do have tornadoes. Which is funny, because, you know, my parents, who grew up in Illinois, have no fear of tornadoes, and they are terrified of earthquakes. And see, y'all who grow up with earthquakes, right, are like, well, yeah, there was another earthquake last night. It's really, that's not really news. But if I told you there's a tornado coming, y'all be freaking out, right? My point is this. We got warning when a tornado was coming because they could track it and they could see it. And there were these awful loud sirens that would go off, right, when there was a tornado. The last time I was at home uh, last December, uh, my mother had been in the hospital, so I made a, a quick last-minute trip home. And just in the, the four or five days that I was there, sure enough, tornado sirens started going off, and we had to all run to the closet and, and hide and you know, make sure everything, all the, the family was safe. But my point is this, we got some warning. Now, see, the Ninevites are getting a warning from Jonah. They're getting a warning. They know what's going to happen ahead of time, but we don't always get that luxury. See, we're told in the Bible what? We don't know when the Son of Man is coming back and that tomorrow is never promised. So the Ninevites are actually getting something that you and I don't necessarily get. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't even know what today is going to bring. But the Ninevites are getting a little early warning here. Let's go ahead and continue with verse 5. It says, the Ninevites believed God. They believed They believed God. Now remember, they didn't worship our God prior to this. They worshiped false gods. Verse 5 says, they believed God. See, Jonah was so worried about going to this place. Jonah was so worried about how his message is going to be received. All he had to say was, hey guys, you got 40 days and God's destroying the city. And just like that, they believed. See, that's how God works. See, when we do what God is asking us to do, he makes things happen for us. He gives us the words. He gives us the message. He causes the result. The result didn't happen because Jonah walked through the city. The result happened because God walked through the city with Jonah. And I love that we're only in verse verse 5, and it says... 
the Ninevites believed God. It says, and a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. It says, when Jonah's, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal clothes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And this is one of those concepts that we see kind of throughout the Bible, this idea of the sackcloth. And the closest thing I can relate this to, and, and maybe some of you will get this and some of you will not, but, but do you all know what a burlap bag is, right? You, some of you know what burlap is. That's kind of what sackcloth was. And the reason that I put that middle picture in there for you is to give you an idea. These were not comfortable clothing. This was not fashionable clothing, although the Kardashians would probably find some way to make that fashionable. But, but this was not comfortable. And, and this experience was a very humbling experience. See, see, even the greatest, they took off their fancy clothes. They put on basically these burlap bags and they covered themselves in ashes. See, it's important that we understand what that means because you see that over and over throughout the Bible. You see them doing this, this kind of act throughout the Bible. And it was an act of humility. This was them not just professing with their lips that, yes, we believe what God is telling us. They were physically showing everyone that they saw that, that, that this is real. And we're taking this seriously. This was not lip service. They put on these, these burlap bags and they covered themselves in ashes and they sat in the dust. Now, see, this would not have been a common occurrence, especially for the king, right? The king would have sat in the palace, dressed in the finest clothes, on these nice marble floors, in a comfortable chair. But see, he's setting the example that even the most powerful man, in what was probably one of the most powerful cities of his day, put on the sackcloth and sat in the dust. The message was being received. It says, this is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. So the king is saying, hey, not only am I doing this, but I want each and every one of you to do the same. And on the surface, you may say, well, what's the big deal if they don't feed the animals? The animals were basically their livelihood at this time. It's how they ate. They sold them to get the goods that they needed. Livestock was kind of like currency back in the day, right? How many, how many in your flock kind of took the place of how big is your house and how many cars do you have? The more livestock you had, the more animals you had, the better. And the king is saying, look, not only are you guys not going to eat, but don't even feed the animals. He was sending a message to his people that, hey, this is serious. We need to pay attention. Verse 8 says, But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently, urgently on God. It says, Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Now remember, we talked about the people of Nineveh. We talked about the people of Assyria. And we talked about the fact that they were barbarians and they worshipped false gods. And this was just not a place you would probably want to be or live. And he's urging them, turn away from your sinful ways, worship God. And I love that he says, urgently call on God. Passion, emotion. We should be emotional about our relationship with God. Because it's important to us. Just like your relationship with your husband or your wife or your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your brothers, your sisters, your kids, whatever it may be, you're passionate about those relationships because these are people that you love. And you would be urgent in doing whatever you could to protect those relationships. And that's exactly what he's urging them to do. It says, who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Here's this king, who up until this point didn't even believe in God, and he's showing more faith than a lot of Christians do. He says, hey, if we do all these things, if we show our love and our respect to him, then maybe he'll save us. And isn't that what it's all about? 
Isn't that the end goal? And see, the king got it. It says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring them the destruction that he had threatened. God had all the power. God had every intention of destroying them. But they heard the message that Jonah brought. They heard the message that Jonah brought and they believed in him. And their faith and that belief is ultimately what saved them. So let's talk about this cycle that Jonah's been in. And again, this is the Cliff Notes version, and I know the kids today have no idea what Cliff Notes are because they have the internet. Jonah flees from the Lord, right? God reacts. God reacted in a big way, right? He created this storm, and then he sent the fish, which again, like we talked about last week, probably not the way Jonah would have liked to have been rescued because God could have sent him a ship. God could have sent him a boat. God could have done many different things to save him, but he didn't. Because he had a plan for him. Jonah prays and then Jonah goes. And, and I think as we look at this cycle of Jonah, and again, I think Jonah kind of gets a bad rap and some of that he probably deserves and some of it maybe is unfair. But if we look at this cycle, I bet you can find yourself in this cycle at some point or another. At some point or another, you and I have all been Jonah. We've all walked away from God. We've all not listened to what God is telling us to do. We've all got on the wrong boat, going the wrong direction. And God reacts. And then what do we do? When things finally get bad enough, we turn to God and we say, God, I need your help. Please save me from this thing that I'm dealing with. And then we have to take action. We have to take action. It's very similar to the cycle that the Israelites went through over and over again, right? They'd turn away from God. God would punish them. God would send a judge. God would save them. And then they'd start all over again. Again, short version. So my question to you is, what is our mission? What is our message? Now, we're not all called to be evangelists. We're not all called to be preachers. But I think we are all called to share Jesus Christ with others. And I think we overcomplicate this because I talk to people all the time and I say, uh, I say, you know, hey, do you, do you talk to your coworkers about Jesus? Do you talk to your, your classmates about Jesus? Do you talk to the people on your team about Jesus? And they go, oh, no, I, I can't do that. I don't know enough. John 3.16 is all you need to know. This is the most common verse that's quoted in the Bible. You know, this is the one that, that the athletes put on their eye black or on their wristbands. And you'd be shocked. Even people that don't know the Bible, even people that have never stepped foot in a church can tell you what John 3.16 says. And if you boil the gospel down to one verse, this is it. If you commit this verse to memory, you know everything you need to know to share the gospel with others. For God so loved the world. That's the story of the gospel right there, right? It's the story of God's love for you and me. And he didn't just love us a little bit, right? He loved us enough to send his son to die for us. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's love. That's big love. That's powerful love, considering most of the world didn't even believe in him when he did this. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish. See, this is just the gospel in a nutshell, right? If we believe in God, then we're not going to die. We just saw that with the story of the Ninevites. Because they believed, he spared them. But we're talking about something bigger here. We're talking about the fact that we can spend eternity with God in heaven. Eternal life. Eternal life. See, this is the gospel. He loved us enough to send his son. Not because you and I deserve it. But because he loves us 
so very much. This is the message that we need to share with others. The fact that God loves you. Even in your sinful state. Even in your broken state. God loves you. That's the only message you have to share with others. You don't have to preach a sermon. You don't have to sit down and do a Bible study with them. You just got to tell them what John 3.16 tells us. That he loves you so much. He wants you to have eternal life. He wants you to have the hope that we have of a life in heaven. And then there's other people that would be happy to sit down and have a Bible study with them. Be happy to talk to them and have those deep, those deep philosophical, theological conversations. You don't have to do that. You just got to tell them how much God loves them. Tell them what Jesus has done in your life. And tell them about that hope that you have because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only message you have to give. It's only a few words. It's only one verse. But that's the gospel in a nutshell. God uses imperfect people. Jonah was imperfect. Jonah was reluctant. Jonah flat out did the opposite of what God told him to do. But if you look at the Bible, we see story after story after story of God using imperfect people. Adam and Eve. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Adam and Eve weren't perfect, right? Adam and Eve actually responsible for bringing sin into the world. Adam and Eve are responsible for us not having a physical one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with God, which is what he intended. Look at Abraham. God, what did God promise Abraham? Promised him he'd have children and that his offspring would bless many. And what did Abraham do? He got tired of waiting around, right? Went and had a kid with somebody else. Still used Abraham in a big way. Look at David. God used David in a big way. And we know for a fact that David made some mistakes along the way, right? But God still used him. And guess what? You and I make mistakes along the way. And God still wants to, can, and will use us if we'll allow him to do so. But just like Jonah, we got to get on the right boat. But you and I are imperfect. Let's just be honest with one another. Nobody in here is perfect. But God still wants to use you. You're still here for a reason. You still have a purpose. He's still equipping you to do work for him. The message is simple. The message is simple. John 3.16. He loved us so very much. Now we know there's more to that, right? We know the, we know the steps of salvation here. Repent, believe, be baptized, live faithfully. I, you know, I, not trying to boil it down too much for you, but I'm saying when you're sharing this with others, you don't have to get into all of that. Just tell them how much they're truly loved. Because we as human beings, it's just in our nature that we need to and want to be loved. And remember that God is responsible for the results. See, God used Jonah to save Nineveh. He could have used anybody that he wanted. Because at the end of the day, God saved Nineveh. Not Jonah. Jonah played a part in that. Jonah got to play a part in one of the biggest revivals that we find in the Bible. This wasn't just the 5,000. This wasn't even the 40,000. This is 120,000 people that came to God. Now that's revival. We used to have revivals. Those of you who have been in the church for a long time, we used to have those, right? Seven days. We went to church seven days in a row. Heard messages. They called them revivals or gospel meetings, if you will. Jonah did it with 120,000 people. So I want you to think this morning, where is your Nineveh? Where is it that God is asking you, that God is calling you to take his message? Maybe it's your own household. Maybe it's your next door neighbor. Maybe it's that person that sits in the cubicle next to you. Maybe it's your teammates. Maybe it's your roommates. I don't know who God is calling you to share with. But see, sometimes we get so caught up in this idea of the mission field, right? And we say, oh, I, I, can't, I can't go to Chile. 
I, I can't go to Africa and spread the message. You don't have to. Southern California is a large enough mission field for all of us. Look at the things that are going on in Southern California. Look at the things that are being taught in our schools. Southern California needs us too. And I'm not saying those other people don't need us. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But I'm saying you need not go farther than across the street to find somebody who needs Jesus. And I want to encourage you to think this morning as we get ready to sing this last song. I want you to think about where's your Nineveh? Where is it that you can feel God calling or prodding you to go? And again, you may have been looking too far. That person may be sitting right next to you. That person may be sitting right next to you at work every single day. Where's your Nineveh? If you can't think of one, pray that God will bring that into your life. Pray that God will show you those people in your life that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite Michael to come back up here in just a moment. I'm going to invite our elders to come forward as well. And, and maybe you've never had a chance to answer the gospel call and be baptized. When you're baptized, it changes your entire life. Because not only are you forgiven of those things that you've done in your past, but you've got hope for the future. And you form that close personal relationship to where you have the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and 377 chances. Because he loves you that much. If you've never had that opportunity, I want to invite you to come forward and be baptized this morning. Or maybe, maybe like Jonah, maybe you've been a faithful servant of God, but you've turned away. You've gotten on the wrong boat. You've been headed down the wrong path. And you just need somebody to talk to and somebody to pray with and somebody that, that truly has your best interest at heart. You're not alone in this. We're going to invite you to come forward if we can help you in any way as we stand together and as we sing. I saw the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on him are radiant. They'll never be ashamed. Never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies. The Son of God surrounds his saints. He will deliver them. He will deliver them. Everything.